because they are actually good. And that could be more or less the comparison between false positives and, and, and actually problems. Five and, okay. Uh, and what exactly we get every month, it's around four, 50 transactions that we need to take care of. And the last slide we'd like to share with you, and I, I will ask Young Bun to come here, is uh, external distributus, what means that for some reason our system did not get the situation when a client comes to your teller and makes a transaction pay you on a specific uh, government tax, that teller could right after uh, cancel that transaction and take the money. So our client would know that, notes that only maybe a year later because the, the, you're gonna know when, when you are faulty with the government with next IRS. Year, yeah. Yeah, it comes someday. So what we, we actually try to do is to get this kind of situation early in the process. So, and this is the project we are running right now. And what we are trying to do in transfer accounts is, is they are used to make possible some, ty uh, some types of accounting transactions. They should be always zeroed at the end of the day. And sometimes it did not happen for a, lot, a number of reasons. So what we are trying to do right now is run some models and try to identify how, when the internal auditing could get to that information and, and try to have, make some, take some action. Thank you, everyone. I will continue this presentation. My name is Yongbom Kim at Rutgers University. All right, let me uh, discuss, uh, let me tell you a little more about the uh, transitory account. The problem of a transitory account is any account in this, com uh, in this company can, be, uh, can become transitory account. Once they start to use it as a temporary space for uh, uh, money transfer, and then it, uh, that account becomes transitory account. And Uri Banco, uh, they, were, uh, they, were, they was not so sure how many transitory uh, accounts were used as a transitory account. But anyway, they estimate about 10,000 accounts were transitory accounts. So they uh, uh, we propose uh, we propose that uh, we uh, we couldn't monitor all twenty three accounts. We have to kind of higher hierarchical uh, scrutiny, and then we will focus on the most risky twenty three accounts. First, level one and level two. From the 10,022 accounts, the level one, uh, lev uh, uh, Unibanco uh, internet, internal audit team chose 150 transitory accounts, 50 from finance, 50 from consumer, and 50 from insurance. And then uh, uh, by analytical procedure, or level one screening, eventually they chose 16 transitory accounts. They are, uh, each account have uh, 17 variables and uh, Originally, they have uh, about uh, 419,000 uh, transactions. And later, after data cleaning, eventually we have uh, 400,000 uh, 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 transactions uh, as a uh, population. Oh, it's very difficult to present while I have uh, time pressure because I have to finish <laughs> 155. So now I have just one minute. <laughs> Okay, there are very huge distinct, uh, distinction between level two and level three screening because level two screening will, uh, would be to impl uh, implement it at a mainframe level, meaning level two screening buzzer or uh, algorithm should be very light, light enough. Why? After uh, op when, uh, applying level, uh, level two screening, the resultant uh, transactions must be large enough. Large enough or also 
we uh, the uh, the mother shouldn't miss any uh, transactions that has a, a sufficiently large amount as well. So we devise uh, we devise two ways of uh, uh, screening. One is I call it two stage screening, and the other one is one stage screening. Two uh, two stage screening. Aggregate daily transactions, and we check the sum, sum of each day, and then if the uh, particular day, uh, total uh, total sum, uh, sum of the transactions are huge enough, and then we choose a particular day, and we will examine the all the transactions. Okay. The other way is just uh, choose the uh, huge, uh, large transactions from the whole population. Two ways, but this one <coughs> will use less system resource, and the second one will use more. But the two uh, two methodology has two uh, uh, both has the advantages and disadvantages. Eventually, for for the time being, we are using union of two results. Screening and screening method. That I think that we just can wrap it up. Basically, what I would like to conclude is that uh, for those kind of indicators that actually are, uh, we can call sacred, in the sense that it's, you know that still it's gonna be used for them, uh, I think that they are applicable for the internal control team or, or for the internal auditing team. It, there's, there's justification for, for implementing this kind of automatization, I think. Uh, on the other hand, what we are doing now is trying to identify more flexible more ways to, to develop indicators, send them to internal control teams and so on to make it more uh, less time consuming and, and probably uh, putting the right things in, in the right place. Sometimes that those kind of indicators can be always fol be followed by, by internal control teams also, so it doesn't need to be internal authors, okay? So this is a, a, a discussion on, on scope that's going through uh, inside my bank, and, and probably you're gonna resolve that on, on the short term, okay? Uh, basically, it's pretty much what I have to, we have to say. Um, Miklos, this is my last slide. No, not really. I'm, <laughs> I'm almost there. <laughs> All right. Um, I know this is a continuous auditing uh, symposium, but I'm going to challenge you to think that continuous auditing may not be the end goal. Okay? The way P&G is approaching uh, continuous auditing or monitoring is we're focusing on what is the business need, what's the business value, how can we reduce effort with the business. An internal audit will then uh, benefit from that by uh, you know, leveraging their, their better control of, uh, of, of their internal controls. Uh, how many of you have heard of the do more for less mantra, right? That's very pervasive within P&G. So um, what we're looking at is we have 140,000 employees and 140 auditors. Where do you think we can get the biggest savings? We focus on the 140 auditors or the 140,000 employees. So we're focusing on the big population. If we can save them effort, we're saving the company uh, you know, money. So um, you may ask, well, why is internal audit leading this? Okay. Well, the business is off working on improving their own business processes. And they're kind of, you know, the way the business thinks is, we have you know, established controls. Let's limit our, our innovation on our business processes based on historical controls. So internal audit is, uh, is taking a look at and leading the R&D efforts or the innovation for internal controls. And that's really why, uh, why we're leading that. We also don't want you know, all, of the, all of our plants or all of our uh, service centers to go off and build their own unique solution that may not be scalable for the company. So internal audit has the, the broad picture. We can build solutions that, that is scalable to the rest of the company. So um, what I'm gonna do today is walk you through the methodology that we're using in, in one project 
for building a, a scalable scorecard.